Welcome to the Hero Maker Podcast. I'm Andrea Shreeman, writer, director, EP, living in LA. I'm Jennifer Morrison, and I currently serve as the Commissioner of Public Safety for the state of Vermont. We are here to seek out and tell the full story of our friends who were murdered in college, Rachel Raver and Warren Fulton III. We really need to make sure that their deaths were not in vain and that every possible lesson and improvement for the system can be squeezed from the retelling of the circumstances that ultimately led to the identification of their killer. Hi, Jen. Did you hear the good news? That the Hero Maker podcast is up for four People's Choice Podcast Awards? Yes. Yes, I did. (sighs) Yay. Well done, Commissioner. It's exciting. Yes. Yes, it's very exciting. Thank you. But you know, I just show up for the conversations. You're the one who does all the heavy lifting. Oh, but do you think we'd be nominated if you didn't ask such insightful questions and take us down some of the most interesting dirt roads? Oh, important dirt roads, like talking about bacon and cocktails. (laughs) So what do folks need to know about the People's Choice Podcast Awards? Well, People's Choice means the people choose. And if you're listening, you are the people. So please, in order to wrestle the Hero Maker podcast out of obscurity, help us do that, go to the link in the description, which is podcastawards.com backslash app backslash sign up. Well, I just nominated us, and it literally took less than five minutes to do the whole thing, including the email confirmation. And I'm just here to say that if I could do it in under five minutes, I am confident that everyone in my daughter's generation can do it in two minutes. Okay, got it. Yes, it was very fast. And you can nominate us in four categories. The Hero Maker podcast is under People's Choice, Best Female Hosted Podcast, Storyteller and Drama, and True Crime. And please nominate us now because the nomination period ends July 31st. And more details are available in our two-minute bonus episode, which came out just before this one. Hey, Andy, we should probably wish America a happy birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday, America. Are you having a celebration on the lake tomorrow, Jen? Do they do fireworks over Lake Champlain? Oh, yes. There's lots of fireworks displays starting last Saturday. Pretty much every night there's one somewhere. Parades in many communities and even a flyover of the Air Guard fighter jets. They managed to cover the entire state in under an hour. Wow. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm jealous. I'm, I mean, I can just imagine what it's like going out on your deck and being by the lake. And it just seems so idyllic. <laughs> and it sounds amazing. And so what are you going to do? I'm going to take a big-ass bike ride tomorrow. Big-ass bike ride. My ass might actually be getting bigger from these bike rides. Stronger. <laughs> my butt is getting stronger, that's for sure. I'm training for my first century ride. So I'm going to get out there and do, I don't know, 30 miles or so. That is amazing. Oh my gosh. What? One more announcement. We have to tell our audience that the same day this episode comes out, July 4th, 2023, we are also appearing as guests on the true crime daily show, The Sidebar, hosted by Joshua Ritter. Yes. Our first public appearance talking about Rachel, Warren, and our hero maker journey. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, thank you, Josh. Okay, so now, today's episode, let's get down to business. Yeah, I feel like we've been waiting for this one for a long time. It was inevitable, and the timing was right. We met with three members of the GW Women's Soccer Program at the time of Warren and Rachel's death. Two women that you played with at the time, Elsa now Oberg and Kate Lunger. Kate was also a co-captain with you. Yes, and joining us on this episode is also Cheryl Helmuth, who served as our team's assistant coach. There were a lot of feels in this conversation, and everyone had something unique to contribute. Elsa actually attended one of the trials. I know it was probably a little different for you than it was for me. I can tell you that just being back together and seeing their faces erased all the years between now and when all of this happened, hearing the different perspectives of how this impacted them and everybody's journey was clearly so different. It was really nice. I, I, it sounds weird, doesn't it? It was really good to know. That was heartwarming. Yeah, to all be together. And to know that this was so significantly impactful to everyone, each in their own way, yet we've all turned out to be functioning human beings and have carried away tremendous lessons from that experience. I agree. 
Thank you, ladies, for joining us. If you're listening to this and it's still July 2023, remember, please go nominate us for the People's Choice Podcast Awards. And it is time to get started with episode 28 now with our guests from GW Women's Soccer circa 1988, Elsa, Kate, and Cheryl. Let's take it away. So, Kate, you had an agenda item? I wanted to say hi to everyone and check in and see where they are because I've seen you and Jen and talked with you all via a bazillion texts, even though we need to get together. But I haven't seen Elsa since I think I left GW and Cheryl the same, maybe? It's kind of crazy. I was in 1989, six months after this terrible sadness we're here getting back together about. So I'm just curious where everyone is. So the question is, uh, where are you? What are you up to? What have you been doing for 30 years? Uh, Yeah, we can totally start there. Go ahead, Elsa. I live in Massachusetts. I met my husband at the 21st Amendment. Yes, at the 2-1. I have three children and I teach elementary math to kids, mostly newcomers from Guatemala. And I work in Waltham. It's literally my dream job. Oh my goodness. Do you live in Waltham? Because I grew up in Concord. I live in Framingham, but we just sold our house and we're moving to Holliston. Wow. My youngest is at University of Miami and we just need the last college payment. So we're moving. That's awesome. Yes. Very exciting. Awesome. Great. So that's Elsa. And who we have here today, Jen, super exciting. We have two other folks that you played on the women's soccer team with at GW, Kate and Elsa. Yes, I played with Elsa and Kate. And then we have Cheryl, who was the assistant coach in 1988. That's right. And Cheryl was herself an incredible standout at our rival, George Mason University. She was a really great player there. And then she came aboard when she was hardly out of college herself, to try and corral this crew. It was an immediate love fest. We all just loved Cheryl. Mm -hmm. So catch us up, Cheryl. What have you been doing? Well, right back at you guys. I kind of didn't do much coaching after you all because you kind of spoiled it for me because you all were such a wonderful group. I loved you guys so much. Still do. After coaching, I went to that rival school and I coached for one year at George Mason. But, you know, it didn't hold a candle to you guys. So I kind of was done with that. And I also had met my husband and we were ready to start our life. And then in 2000, we moved out to Colorado for his job. We thought it would be a quick turnaround because we had the only grandchildren on both sides of the family at that point. And we fell in love with Colorado and getting out of the Northern Virginia hecticness, even though it took us away from family. We've been here ever since. We live out in the foothills outside of Denver in Evergreen, Colorado. I have two daughters. She's turning 29 in September, my oldest. My youngest is 25, and she lives in the Netherlands. But luckily, my oldest lives only an hour, 20 minutes away. And she and her wife have my first grandchild, Tony. And I'm smitten. Career-wise, I worked at a vet for a while because that had always kind of been a dream job. I was a volunteer and I ended up working at my church for a while and very involved in the church activities here. And of course, raising kids in all their activities. I only coached, kind of helped out a little bit with my youngest for one season. You didn't tell them what a good soccer player you were? You know, I was on a great team. I did my part on a great team. I was not a super standout. I enjoyed playing, and it was all about the team for me. I didn't have huge accolades, or they know, but, you know, it's your mom. It's a long time ago, so. (laughs) Hey, Cheryl, fun fact that Elsa might not know. Shreem's probably doesn't know. I was at your wedding. You sang at my wedding. I know. (laughs) Oh <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the morning is broken. We just yes. had that in church the other day. I was like, oh, they sang that at my wedding. Yes. Yeah. I did sing at her wedding. It was very sweet. And I adore her husband. Oh. Well, we had a lot of fun at that. There were a lot of GW girls there. So we had a good time. Indeed. Awesome. Kate, catch us up. Oh yeah, Kate, tell us all about you. For the last 33, 34 years, I have been working in television and doing a whole bunch of different things. When I left GW, I backpacked that fall for three months, and then I came back and worked in television and moved, no joke, 21 times in 10 years. 
I lived in Colorado for a couple of years and freelanced and did Olympics and the local TV show and a whole bunch of other things. I came to CNN in 93 on the technical side and I left to go to Japan for a year. And then I came back to CNN in Washington, DC, and then to Atlanta. I did not want to move to Atlanta and I met my husband a week later. I've run the special events unit for 25 years and I've run it since 2009. Next year, we will be married 25 years, and I am retiring after 30 years in TV, and I don't know what the heck I'm going to do. I'm really just going to put my feet up for a little while and see where I wander next, because it's just been a lot. <laughs> but it's been fantastic. I've been all over the world. Congratulations on your retirement. Well, Jen, you and I'll talk, because I'll retire probably as well as you do. <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping you're a little better at it than I've been. <laughs> no. New adventures. Yeah, new adventures, no doubt. Well, unfortunately, the reason that we get to look upon each other and catch up is that you guys are now officially becoming part of our hero maker journey. Andrea and I have been working on this passion project for a while, she longer than I. It feels to me like a really big moment to bring some of the women's soccer team together to get your perspective and talk about this. We're well into season two, 25 or six or seven episodes under our belt. And it's time for our audience to hear from someone other than me about how this impacted us. And I know everybody has their own unique perspective. I'm looking forward to this, guys. I really am. And thank you for making the time. Well, thank you all of you for making this happen. Absolutely. I think a place to start would be, who was Rachel to you? Where were you when you got the news? Like, what was that moment? Let's start with Kate on that one. Gosh, Rachel. The very first person I met at GW, when we came in for preseason, the coach, and I don't remember his last name, John, met me and my parents and had another person there to help us unload our car and throw our stuff into the athletic department storage space because we were going out to Virginia to another girl's house to sleep on the floor for a week and do preseason. And Rachel was that person. And she was standing on the steps of the building and she came running down with her legs. And you all remember her just, the, you know, she was so slender and she had so much energy. And she just was this amazing feeling to be like, welcome to GW. And I will never forget that. And especially freshman year, we were super close. There was a whole group of us who most of you probably don't know who were seniors and even juniors. I remember 10 of us sitting on the bed together and all laughing and telling stories. And when we moved into one of the dorms right near the Metro and we cooked every night because we all had kitchens and we store stuff over holidays because we were switching dorms and Rachel helped us move everything. And her boyfriend at the time, Josh Abelman, was a big part of that whole group of people. I remember sharing clothes with her and I didn't have any sisters. And she was just one of those people along with Susie Weil and a bunch of other people. So she was super, super special in that way. Obviously, we stayed in touch over the years and she was a year older than me and, and she graduated. And on that horrible, horrible Tuesday, it was sadly my 21st birthday. And I remember going to Tower Records. For those of you who remember Tower Records, you actually bought tapes, <laughs> went in and bought myself a couple tapes and came back into the dorm. And I was all excited because I was 21 and I could go out or do something that night, even though it was a weeknight. And I walked out in the room and Jen was there. And my boyfriend from the baseball team was there. And my roommates were there. And I remember Jen saying, you have to tell her or something like that. And it was one of those, like, no one really knew what was going on, but all the information was just coming in on the news. And I think Jen, you had been watching the news and someone got a phone call because there were no cell phones. And it was horrific. It was horrific. And I still think about it and it's a natural feeling and you feel guilty about it. And I remember being so angry because it was my birthday and I knew for the rest of my life I would have that. And as I've gotten older, I've also realized for the rest of my life, I'll have her in my head and, and Warren, it's, a, it's that memory of the person she was and the happiness and joy she, she brought to so many people. Thank you, Kate. That's a great kickoff for sure. Cheryl, what about you? No, we should go coach last because coach has big responsibility for students. Coach last, Elsa next. I was actually in China because I studied abroad in Nanjing for that semester. So I wasn't home. I always wish I was home because I feel like I missed a lot. I didn't go to her funeral, but my husband 
who he's sitting right here, did go. I asked him to go. And um, my mom called me on a landline, obviously, and she couldn't really spit it out. And so I was starting to ask what happened, who died. I thought my dad died. I thought my brother died for some reason. And um, yeah, it was very unsettling. I just felt like I never 100% dealt with it at the moment because I wasn't there. And I felt like by the time I got back to school, the services were over. And I remember talking to Kate was really sweet in the Smith Center one time and just saying that I wish I were there for the services but I was lucky enough to keep close with her mom and her sisters and I just went to one of the last trial the death penalty phase of Creato's trial and just love her mom so much and I always felt like her death kind of ended college for me because I just felt like we had so much fun and we were super, super silly. I just remember having a lot of fun on road trips in Florida where maybe we didn't win, but I had a ton of fun and we went to Colorado and I just remembered it all being really, really fun. I have great memories of Rachel. I was telling, um, I hope I'm not going on too long. No, you're doing great. I went to a lot of SAE parties, a lot of frat parties with Josh, because I was two years younger than Rachel. And I do remember being carried up the stairs of a frat house. My son's here. My son, who just turned 21. um, And being put into someone's room. And Rachel was at the door. And I was just passed out. And she just started these two young guys just were looking in the room like oh who's in the room who's in there and she just screamed at them like get the hell out of here get away from her get out of here I think it was the me too movement like me thinking of her doing that for me was really really powerful and just feeling a sense of sadness of her death I told her sister that story Dee Dee like just wanting them to know what she did for me as a young adult She was a fierce protector and friend, right? Yeah, she was fun. Like my memories of GW soccer are just fun, fun, fun memories. And Rachel was just a huge part of that. Elsa, she just made us laugh all the time when we weren't supposed to be laughing. (laughs) Right on. Like how? I'm really curious about this because I wasn't there for the team moments. She like a clown or was she kind of undermining the leadership or (laughs) What if- no, none of the above. No. We would lose a game. We'd be very serious about it. And she would just say something, well, like, well, what are we doing for dinner? Or like realizing that you could move on or, well, I can't remember anything specific. I just remember the feeling. And I think what Elsa was saying was that she gave you a feeling of happiness and warmth, even if you didn't want it. <laughs> she liked the food part of the road trips. Yes, she did. <laughs> Elsa, did you know Rachel before college? No, I met her when I was a freshman and we just started going out to the 2-1 and going to frat parties and having a lot of fun in college and having a ton of fun, silly pictures at Epcot. Oh my God, Epcot. Those are like my favorite memories. Less of the training and the Brazilians that we had to do and more of just like all the super fun, fun parts of being on a college sports team. It's awesome. The Williamson County Cultural Arts Commission of Franklin, Tennessee wishes to thank our men and women in blue who help us deliver safe and fun family and community cultural events year-round, including one of the only authentic bluegrass festivals in the country. Bluegrass Along the Harvest takes place every July and at the Williamson County Fair in August and at the annual Tennessee International Independent Film Festival. Check out our full calendar of events at wccac-tn.org. Before we go on to Cheryl, Jen or Kate, do you want to talk about, I remember one of you talking about the transition 
of when you came into the school and GW's women's soccer had gone division one and there was some scholarship athletes, or maybe even Cheryl can speak to this, who came in and was started to displace a little bit of the old guard. Yep. And she was part of that old guard. Someone want to speak to how she reacted to that or what that was like? Kate, you want to take a swing at that? Yeah, I'll start first. We were Division One when I was there. And I think when we had been for a couple of years, I think the difference was they started getting a little bit more money for scholarships, but they can only do partial scholarships. And I honestly don't remember if Rachel had one or not, or if she had one, it was somewhere, I think, taken away, which really could suck, I'm sure. Yeah, money got redistributed. It was like a multi-year shift from a club sport, which I think was probably right around the time that you came in, Kate, because I, I was in the first or second class where- Well, you weren't in the first. No, you because you were a year ahead of me. I don't think Joni was club either, and she was two years ahead. So maybe she was the first year, but it was- right. There was a transition from club to a D1 program, and that's exactly right, that the scholarship money was slow to trickle in, but it picked up. And my freshman year was the first year that the new coach had been brought in and he had been given enough money to actually recruit a class of of athletes. So there was a pretty large freshman contingent. And I don't know the exact financial details, Kate, but if you told me that some partial scholarship money was redirected during that sort of rebuilding of the program under a new coach, I wouldn't be surprised to hear that because there was definitely a little bit of the, okay, this is the line of demarcation because this is the new coach and he's building a program with newfound money and emphasis on this. Everybody got along great. Like be very clear, there were no overt hard feelings, but there was definitely a little bit of a shift in the intensity of how we trained and what our schedule looked like and the road trips we were able to go on. We could fly now instead of taking vans. And there was definitely an old guard, new guard, and it worked fine. Everybody loved one another, but it was there. That was a reality. Okay. That's a great entree for Cheryl. (laughs) Come on in, Cheryl. Tell us who Rachel was to you and your experience of uh, when you heard the news and anything else you want to speak to. We've said a lot so far. Yeah, well, Rachel was just a joy. And I just, when I think of Rachel, I think about her smile. But there she is on the senior night. Oh, I know that picture. Yeah, there she is on the senior night. And here's her in England. We also took a trip to England. She looks more serious there. And I just ran into these a month ago. I was like, oh, look at there's Rachel, which was just a joy. But I don't know if you guys remember, but she just lightened things when we needed it sometimes. And I would say it was not inappropriate. I never felt that way. It was just sometimes a team needs to lighten up, you know, and have fun and laugh together and remember the joy of being a team. Do you remember tequila? Yeah. Mm-hmm. She would always do that little tequila dance dun, 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 and dance across. And every time I hear that song, I think of her and just what a joy she was. I only really overlapped with her one year. We did the England trip, I think. She was on that England trip, right? Yeah. Just joy. When I thought of Rachel Joy. And I heard from Jen. I was working as an assistant manager at a fitness center. And it was off season. Soccer wasn't really a year-round thing. We would occasionally get together. You guys would invite me to parties out of season. So I was at, at my job. And like Kate said, it was before cell phones, so I got a call. Jen told me, and I just could not comprehend it. It just, I heard it. I understood the facts that she was telling me, but I didn't really take it in, I don't think. I remember talking to you about it, but I don't remember details past that, that you called, and I was standing behind the desk at the fitness center, and that I had to be functional for my job and just keeping it up here to some degree, but not really digesting it yet. And then when I got home, I turned on the news and the news was pretty horrific. Mm -hmm. The visuals on the news. um, And I just, that's when it was really started sinking in. And I was just like, what, what? And I won't go into details, but the visuals are terrible. We've already talked about them. Have you? Yeah. Okay. It made it very real, put it that way. And my roommate was there. She had a connection with a counselor because I think she saw my reaction. She, and she knew how invested it was in you guys too. And she said, you 
you cannot be the one taking care of your kids, your team, because you're going through this too. And I remember kind of being mad, like, of course I'm going to be there for my team. And at the same time, the more I digested it, the more I realized she was right. I knew how tight you all were and that you guys were going to be there for each other because I've been part of a close team and I understand that bond. So I knew that was going to happen. And I knew the university would be there to some degree. I don't remember us doing more than that. I've heard the baseball team version of this a while ago. I just happened upon this podcast. And so I heard that you guys were wrapped in with them and I was hugely grateful for that. And I remember our travels to New York to go up for the services. That was huge. We were all together for that. And I remember the Smith Center or wherever the location was where we had the service there or Kate got up and spoke. But a lot of the other details are kind of foggy for me, frankly. It had a huge impact on me. And I shared with Andrea before on the phone call, but I'm not sure this is right. May I just add one thing here to Elsa? I can't imagine being that far away yeah. in the world where when you start talking about TV and images and everything, it, it wasn't the world of 24 seven where you could Google and see what was going on. So to your point of making a very expensive phone call yeah. to call home to, I can't wait to find out who you married and met at the two one, but that'll be later <laughs> or your mom to understand, like I at least had Jen and everybody and also the baseball team because the baseball and soccer team, that was my whole life of four years. I don't know what I would have done without them or anyone else. I mean, I don't remember that you were in China and my heart's breaking right now, even thinking about it. So I'm glad I was nice to you when I saw you in the Smith Center in the spring. Gosh, I mean, that's hard. That's a terrible thing to go through alone. Absolutely. Yeah. I went with my dad after the fact. I remember driving to her grave from Massachusetts because it was on the way to Washington. And that was really tough. Connecting with her family and finally catching Prieto is like actually super, super healing and getting to know her family. Cheryl, I know, and Kate and I have talked about it a little bit, but I know how hard it was to feel responsible for the younger players on the team who looked up to me and Kate for direction, for comfort, to tell them it's okay, this is still a safe city. Like I know how hard that was for us because you couldn't say it was okay. And you couldn't say this is still a safe city in that space, you know, in that kind of time. I just wonder if as a coach, if that was an even bigger burden, I know we heard from coach Castleberry that he just didn't know how to respond to his players. I know how I felt and how responsible I felt for the freshmen and sophomores who looked up to me. And I wondered if you had other thoughts about that. Well, I'm a fairly protective personality. I really want to protect the people I love and care about and people in general. I went through a phase of, and it doesn't make any sense, but I felt like I should have somehow protected her. All you guys, you know, I felt like I needed to protect all of you. And I don't remember talking personally people, but but what I did was we needed to catch this guy. What we had for a period of time, we had the description of the car. Because remember, the car was missing for a while, and we thought, that's the connection. This was my trying to be active in some way after the counselor was like, you can't be the counselor kind of person for them. I went around, and I, I made little flyers of the description of the car and the contact information, if you had information. And I used the hotel copier. I made hundreds and hundreds of copies. And before I would go in to open the fitness center at 6 a.m., I went at 3 a.m. to the Pentagon parking lot and started just putting these flyers under the windshields as far as I could cover before I had to go to work just to try to get some connection to that car to find it, to get more information, to try to track something down. And it probably wasn't the wisest thing to do, but it was something I felt I could do and I needed to do something. Yeah, there was a lot of responsibility, but I wish I could say I remember pulling you all in like a chicken under my wings or whatever, but I was there for the events and we were all together and and everybody needed it more in their own way. But I don't remember specifically any special team meetings. I did know you guys were getting taken care of. Somehow I, I remember that feeling, but I don't remember details. I think we took care of each other to the best of our ability. Yes. And to your point, but... 
I don't remember the school. I, I don't want to fault them in a way that it was a different world then. And people looked at things differently, but I was the daughter of a psychiatrist. So I knew that you could get help out there, but we weren't really offered anything that I recall. Maybe Jennifer remembers differently. Maybe I chose not to, but I relied on my teammates and my boyfriend and the baseball team for that support. Again, maybe I didn't feel that I could get it from the adults either because it was so personal. What I do know is that the not remembering is very common mm -hmm. for people who I've talked to about this. They remember snapshots and it's like any situation that isn't a big trauma your memory is incomplete and it can fill in over the years. It can be rewritten by other people telling you what you did or didn't do. There's like a lot that can happen in recalling memory. I do remember that we were brought in or invited into the Smith Center into a classroom. Yeah. And that some sort of a counselor from the college, I believe, spoke to us. I remember- but That was once, right, Jen? Yeah, once. I remember very little about it other than it happened. Yeah. Likewise, Cheryl- I remember that I called you, but if you had asked me to recount that in a free narrative until you said it, it wouldn't have been what I remember. I remember being in the room with the people as Kate described. I remember Kate coming in. I remember somebody leaving, so upset, leaving. And then the next thing I truly have a clear memory of is being in my room down the hall from where I had run into you, Kate, and calling home and calling my mom. Yeah. I talked to my mom recently about calling her and she absolutely remembers me calling her, but I can't ever remember talking to her. But I mean, I talked to her about this just recently in the last year after Shreem's called me about this podcast. Yeah. I remember calling home and crying so hard that I couldn't speak to my mom. And yeah, oh. it's because when I get really angry and scared, I cry. Or when I get really scared, I get angry. And so that was sort of where we were. But Shreem's, you, you were going to bust in on something here. Yeah, I so we haven't really outspokenly said that Jennifer and Kate at the time of Rachel and Warren's death were co-captains of GW Women's Soccer. Yep. So I'd love for you to just speak a little bit from that perspective. What responsibility fell on your shoulder? How did the dynamic of the team change? How did the dynamic of being in Washington, D.C. change for you and your teammates? I know you were off season. Were there any ripple effects of this event in terms of the team and the dynamic and what was going on? Go ahead, Kate. So I'm guessing Jen and I had similar yet very different experiences because she still had a year left and I had just finished my senior season. And I was also dating a baseball player and you've heard the baseball story, right? So I was involved in that and experiencing some of my recovery. I don't know if that's the right word th with them as well. I do think having to be a leader and try and be strong for people set me up for different parts of my life that have sort of played through. I've continued to sort of be that person in different worlds that I fall into of a leader. People rely on, people look to you when things are getting upset or the world is turning or your company is sold or whatever. For me personally, there's maybe some positivity of coming out of that. I also remember thinking, holy crap, what am I supposed to tell these people? I don't know what to tell them. But I do remember that, like the, the scared part I don't know that I felt as much of the scared part of DC. And it was interesting when I, Tommy Williams was talking about it and saying that he would run through the streets of DC. And I, mm -hmm. yes, but I don't know. I like, maybe I didn't want to feel that. And maybe as women, we all knew to travel together. You didn't usually walk by yourself and maybe guys didn't do that. So I, I think that was different. And then I left and I went on to my life and traveling and getting a job. And Jen had to go back the next year. So I'd like to hear what you... Between menopause and COVID brain, I don't remember as much as I would like to, but maybe you can fill in some of that. Well, there's also a lot of years since. I remember feeling like there was a fundamental shift. We had had a very, shall I say, uh, naive existence inside the big city. I came from a small town in New England, and many of my teammates did too. And we would do things like obviously go to the 2-1, but certainly that was by last call. Frequently, we would start down in Georgetown and five or eight of us from the team would walk down to Georgetown and go to one of the ladies' nights where you pay a five or a $10 cover and you drink all you want. And we would do ridiculous things like play Frogger across M Street, where we'd all be walking or stumbling down the sidewalk and somebody in the group would scream, Frogger! And the last one to the other sidewalk 
despite the parking and the four lanes of traffic and buses, et cetera, whoever made it last had to buy the next round at the next place. And so we kind of had this like carefree, ridiculous existence of we're totally safe in the city. And we would sometimes leave the 2-1 or there was another place around the corner from there. I can't remember the name of it right now. We would sometimes leave by ourselves because the dorms were pretty close. We're talking less than five city blocks, right? Probably like three. People did walk around by themselves, intoxicated, one, two, three in the morning, go to get a Manoush dog in front of Tower Records, see who you run into at Manoush, right? And then go back to your dorm. And I remember that changing fundamentally for me, that it was not a safe place to cavort and walk alone or be alone or be vulnerable by being intoxicated or not paying attention. So that was a fundamental shift for me. And I think I regarded everything from that point on, particularly when I was the ringleader of any group going out, I feel like it changed for me. It wasn't as carefree and light as it had been. I also felt like I had to come up with some messaging for our younger players because they were looking for answers. And in some cases, they didn't know Rachel that well, but they knew that something horrible had happened to a a teammate, a member of the team, whether they played with her or not and not having any answers. And then as time went on, because we all went home shortly after that, it was like not even two weeks until we were Mm -hmm. done with Mm -hmm. exams and Mm -hmm. went home for a month's break. We came back in the spring, we had spring training, we had schedules to keep, we had some road trips, no answers. And it felt like forever. And then that just kept on and on through the next year. And there was no answers to give to people, the no why, the no who, what could have been done to prevent it. And that was really infuriating to me and many other people who just wanted to know why. And so I also left with no closure. I I think I was glad, Jen, that I was gone because I didn't have to endure that. And Elsa, want to ask you also, you came back to that in the next year. What do you remember? I remember the crime rate in D.C. was... Higher. You mean the mayor's crime rate? The mayor who was committing crimes or just the crime rate in general? Yeah, Mary and Barry. <laughs> yeah, it was the highest in the U.S. Yeah. at the time. Yeah. The murder rate. Yeah, it was high. And I do remember, I think because I was out of the United States, that's like the reality of guns. I didn't feel as safe. I did for years just wonder and was so happy when the DNA came back, just that poor family just went so long without answers. And I remember what Cheryl said about the car, looking, thinking about the car. And then Mrs. Raber started getting tickets out of New York City from the car when they finally found it. They like dumped it in New York or something. Yeah, I just remember wanting answers that weren't there. One of the things that I remember the following year, I think you were gone, Kate, but it might have been your senior spring. But I remember prior to leaving GW, being interviewed by Unsolved Mysteries, by one of those programs that- Like on the corner in front of the Smith Center? Smith Center. That's exactly right. Yeah, vaguely. I think you were on it too. You think about your life, that should be a big memory. Like, hey, I was interviewed for a national TV program, but it's such a vague memory. I know it happened and yet it yielded nothing. And so it became sort of like a, okay, tick that off. We did that. Oh, found the car tick that off. In retrospect, that has evidentiary value, but at the time it turned out to be a bit of a dead end. The whole not knowing. If you or someone you know is connected either personally or as the result of violent crime to Alfredo Prieto, a convicted rapist and killer who lived in and around San Bernardino, California, Arlington, Virginia, and Jamaica, Queens, New York, between the years of 1984 and 1990, We'd like to hear from you. Please email us at info at the hero maker podcast.com. I know this is a little bit dark, and I, I do think that this really impacted Jen's life because she ended up heading up a sex crimes unit and really having been a survivor herself of a close friend who went through sexual assault and was murdered, she was able to literally, Jen, in your career, take your personal experience and bring deep empathy to your work that others in your professional position may have not had that, quote, advantage. But I would just like to know if we can speak just for a moment about the sexual assault piece. 
And if that landed for anyone, to me, it's so horrifying and so grotesque and really beyond what we would ever imagine. We, you couldn't even imagine that something like that would happen to anyone that you know. Did that have any kind of lasting impact on anyone's experience? Maybe even as a parent, right? Because I think all of you have had kids in college or raised girls. <laughs> Elsa, did you raise girls? I do. I have a daughter. That memory is just like inexplicably tied to her mom, who at one of the trials just yelled out to him. He shot her and then raped her. And just like Vera yelling at him that and it was just very satisfying that she was saying that to him in court and I was always happy that she had that having to sit and listen to the mom having to hear that is just too much sometimes to think of like her mom's reality I think her dad was just never the same after that yeah, I heard about that, and I'm going to misquote, but she yelled something to the effect of, does your mother know that you rape dying girls or something like that? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the whole experience had made me more willing to step into uncomfortable and extremely sad or traumatic situations with others and abide with them and accompany them to some extent and not be afraid to, to just be there for them. I was in a really dark place after this, and I had to really take kind of a extreme opportunity to turn it around. And will you tell that story for everybody, Cheryl? Oh, I didn't know if you wanted that. Yeah, yeah. Yes, please. Okay, I was in a really dark place after this. It it shook me. I was naive. I wasn't much older than you guys, and I felt like I could protect the world, right? And I couldn't. And I was dark for a long time. And my whole view of people, what are they going to do? You know, I love people. And it was all of a sudden I was wary of everybody. I didn't trust people. I was skittish around certain areas, just very different from my norm. And I'm a Christian person and I was praying about it. I was like, I need some help here. I don't want to be like this. And I prayed about it for a while and I was at my job. Part of my job was opening the mail, putting activities on the bulletin board. I opened this thing and it was this bike ride across the country for the American Lung Association that was going to happen in like two months. It wasn't just that. It was like some, ent and this sounds woo-woo and I'm not a woo-woo person, but it was like someone was there going here. And I was like, but I don't have a bike. I don't ride here. But you have to raise $5,000 here. And so I said, okay, I'll go see if I can find a bike. Well, the perfect used bike was available and I could afford it at the time. And then I was like, well, I'll see if I can get time off. And things just kept happening. So it's a bike trip from Seattle to Atlantic City over the summer, seven week long. I fell in love with people again. I fell in love with humanity again. It was not easy. There was a hit and run and someone was killed of our group on the trip. But I had a different perspective. I had a bigger picture. And most people are good. And I didn't want this guy to make me a dark presence in the world. I feel like we're all part of a little disco ball mirrors. And we all reflect light out into the world. And if one of those is darkened, less light's out in the world. So this made this guy not win, if that makes sense. And makes me hold Rachel in the joy instead of the darkness after the fact. And then because of all that and this healing opportunity I was presented with, I've been able to go into difficult situations and see the bigger picture, not be falsely positive or anything, but just accompany someone in their darkness because I've been there and I've been able to move through it by the grace of God. It's hard to tell people, hey, you had this presence telling you to do this thing that you never in a million years would have done. But it was what I needed. It was exactly what I needed. And I was able to come back and be a positive impact with you guys after the fact. Otherwise, I'm not sure I could have kept coaching. I went on to do the Stephen Minister training in our church. You know, I've taught confirmation for 20 years. I've helped lead people to go into Mexico, even when Juarez was a mess, to build houses. I've found that service 
and being there for other people is very healing as well. I don't know if there's a silver lining, but things I've learned from it is to be there for other people. Cheryl, you were always there for us, whether you knew it or not. And obviously this made you bloom even farther. Yep. Jen and Elsa, I, you are a rock for us, whether you knew it or not. So I'm sorry you had to go through all that in the way that you did. All, all of us process differently. Well, thank you, Kate. It was a gift to be able to be there for you. And that was my hope and prayer that I could in some way. And so to be able to recover that again, to be able to feel like I could be there for you guys again was huge for me. It was just a gift. Pounding the streets, putting out flyers isn't going to do it. Somehow it was a gift given to me and I'm eternally grateful for it because I can go back to that foundation too. Even when things happen and things aren't right and the world's nuts, I can go, hey, somehow God's got this. I don't have to see it and I don't have to understand it, but somehow God's got this. And I was just a small little spiral person on the outside. We all have to grieve and do our own things. So I can't speak to anybody else, but that was my situation. You weren't just somebody on the outside, as Kate just mentioned. Your boss, who was our head coach, was not able to provide any type of emotional support or any other, I mean, logistical support. I know he organized vans and stuff to go up to New York, but in terms of nurturing us and helping us, particularly for me, I will say you were the one I was turning to. And so if you have gaps in memory or aren't sure how well you did your job, I can assure you, you did exactly what we needed because here we are all uh, pushing through. Well, thank you. It's interesting that a seven week bike ride helped you I think if somebody asked me how I coped with it, my answer would be, well, apparently what I know now is that I didn't cope with it. And somewhere along the way, Andrea came up with this bright idea. And so we've been incrementally unpacking it and coping with it for Jen for what, the last year streams? Yeah. Well, I've been doing it with you all via the podcast as well. (laughs) Yeah. Thanks. I moved on with my life and again, think about it all the time. I, I'm thankful selfishly that there wasn't social. I, I was in the news. I probably could have found stuff out. I didn't go looking for it. I didn't want to know because we heard some things that had happened, but there was no confirmation like there was today. You knew she was shot in the back and things like, I just didn't want to know more. And I think because I don't know that I could have moved on to do what I needed to do at life. Elsa, when you said your youngest son is 21, Mine it just turned 21 in January. And this is a horrible mother story, but kind of funny. And Rachel probably would have loved it. It was his 21st birthday. We went to surprise him. And I literally were all running down the stairs and they had been drinking. And my husband, I'm walking down these stairs. It's like two in the morning. And I was just like, I'm so glad I got to experience a 21st birthday because mine sucked. The kid asked me, he's like, wow, what happened? And I was like, uh, two of my friends were murdered. And he was like, what? And honestly, it made me laugh and it made me cry all at the same time because I was so thankful and I don't have daughters and I'm probably really happy I don't have daughters because I don't have to worry about things the same way. That was just this year. It's always going to be there. But to your point, Cheryl, I think I've been able to have empathy for people in ways that I didn't realize I had. And maybe some of it came from this. Thank you for sharing that, Kate. That's really interesting to me that you actually, all these years later, got to have a 21st birthday. (laughs) We kind of need to wind down, but I feel like we just scratched the surface. So I would love to just take a moment and each maybe think about something that you definitely don't want to leave this conversation without sharing. Something that you remember, something that was meaningful, something about maybe even as the years went by, how these events came back into your life or when you heard about they caught him or the execution or any of that, we could all go around and share a story. I will share one story um, because I was a little bit on the periphery of their lives. I knew Rachel and Warren and had had interactions with them, but was not on the baseball team, was not on the soccer team. And what I do remember is one of the gymnasts was very socially involved with the baseball team and dated at least one baseball player. (laughs) I remember the time. I remember the period of time and I remember the cloud of darkness. And I remember everybody moving together as a group. Everyone just magnetized to each other and just held on to each other and would just move around as one big pod of like a family. And I remember 
that pod was moving in front of me at the rat. Was it called like the rat skeller or something on the fifth floor of the Marvin Center one day? And I remember everybody kind of turning a corner and I looked at my friend who was on the gymnastics team and just the anguish, like the deep anguish that was in her eyes and was moving through that group that I had a front row seat to that anguish. And that was the piece that I wanted to share from my experience. You know, I think it's a a gift to be able to be together on the screen today and share. I've only gotten through like the Velma episode. I haven't gone through any further. I happened upon finding this. I think I saw a post somewhere and I've taken it in increments because it is healing to hear. And I don't know all the details yet because I'm kind of careful of how I expose myself to that. Even now, it's special to be together with people that get it is what I'm trying to say, is to have this conversation and to hear other people's conversations, to be able to be around people that get it. How shocking, how hurtful, how scary, how painful for not just our community, but the community of her family and her hometown and the ripple effects. It makes you realize how far someone's life ripples out into the world and someone dying you have one kind of grief, but someone in this way, it's just different. And to be able to share it and hear it in the podcast, I commend you guys for doing that and inviting us here together. I was so excited to see you guys, but it also at the same time, it's very bittersweet. The reason that's why I wanted the pictures, because I want to keep Rachel forefront. Like I said, I'm so many removed. I'm not a direct family member and I knew Rachel some, but not like you guys did. We all have our journey to take, and any way to help someone heal is such a gift. And I appreciate your efforts to do this, and I appreciate this time together with you guys and to see your faces and to hear your stories. We lost someone special, and that's hard, and we all deal with that in a different way. We all take a part of Rachel and Warren. I didn't know Warren at all. We all take a part of them into our lives and try to add to the world instead of subtract, brighten instead of darken. So thank you. Well, thanks for listening to the podcast. It certainly is healing for me to be part of it. And I think that titrating the dosage is going to be a good thing for some people and other people are going to plow right through it and hear the episodes. Some of the episodes really are dirt roads that we take as part of this journey, but love your feedback, any of it. Elsa, what are your thoughts? I'm super grateful of one of her friends that lived with her at the time, Erin and Wendy. Wendy was actually with me on the first time I met my husband and the first date I had with my husband. They actually testified in her trial. I don't know if you remember, Erin was the trainer. I know Erin, yeah. They were actually like really good friends and kept me abreast of the trial and what was happening. And I just have incredible respect for the strength of her mom and her brother and her sisters are just unbelievable. I just admire them and pain for them. I'm so happy that I connected with her mom because she was a badass and fought for her daughter her entire life because she struggled with cancer. And that woman was unbelievable. Like I wish all of you like met her because she was a spark plug and she just loved her daughter so much, but she didn't let this end her life, but every strength that woman had, she fought for her daughter to have justice. And she was just, God, I loved her. She was an awesome woman. And it was a blessing that I got to know her. And Elsa, I bet your relationship with her was a huge blessing for her as well. Yeah. We were both Lithuanian. So she called me the Lithuanian girl. (laughs) She was awesome. Do you remember her parents coming to the soccer games? Rachel, I think, got her laugh from her mom. Her mom was awesome, yes. I just remember her coming to the games. We used to love when we would go up closer to to New York because they would always come. Oh, it was so much fun. When you said you didn't know Warren, Cheryl, I I knew Warren because of the baseball team. I knew him through Rachel. I wasn't super close with him at that point, but he was a lovely human being. That team... They just thought he was the best. So those two together made so much sense. 
I mean, I was friends with Josh, you know, her, her ex-boyfriend, and we had been for years. And I just remember, I think I rode in the van with him up there. And I'll, I don't remember who else was in that van. Jen, you might have been in that van to the funeral. Like, it was awful. What I would say is, and I think the family's pretty amazing. I am sure that Rachel is thrilled and thankful that you two are doing what you're doing with this podcast, especially the dirt roads, Jen, that you take, because that's what the goal of this is. Yes, you want to tell the story, but you want to make things better. Victims advocacy, like we didn't know about that. We were all victims in some ways, right? All these things that you all are looking into. And I just thank you for doing that. I mean, I listen, I can't listen to it all at once either for the same reasons as Cheryl, but I've listened to a lot more. I'm a few behind. (laughs) And that family, it makes me want to reconnect with all of you in different ways too, which I think is another blessing. Jen, do you have a final story? I remember the van ride too, Kate. I think it was actually two vans. It was two or three vans and it was nuts. And I just want to say this about that. It was hot and it was long and it was wrestlers and baseball players. And soccer players. GW soccer players and a couple gymnasts. I just remember it being a much longer ride than advertised and it was really hot and we were all in dress clothes to go to a wake and it was just a bit of a mess. Oh, and we couldn't get food because no one had money. Like, oh, just, I remember so much of it. I do too. Yet so little. There was something about not having a gas card and we all had to chip in so Adrian could put gas in the (laughs) tank. I mean, there was like, it was a little bit of an ill-fated voyage, but it got the job done. It was so amazing being with everyone. Anything that's unsaid? I don't want to rush off if we're... The reality is we could have talked for hours, Andrea. We could have just kept talking. So I I think we made... Yes. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your experiences. Thank you for being part of this oral history. Hey, Cheryl, in case you missed it, I was just letting Elsa and Kate know that Laura and Tracy and I are all attending alumni weekend this year. So you might want to come on down to Washington, D.C. It's either September or October. Well, if you guys let me know the information, I might. I think it's the last weekend in September. Okay. Well, I'll check it out. I'll see if I can do that. To play Frogger? Yeah, to play Frogger. (laughs) Oh, no, there's no playing of soccer. I told you. No, to play Frogger. Oh, to play Frogger. Oh, maybe. Frogger. (laughs) Not soccer. Oh, man. What could possibly go wrong at our age? <laughs> you guys aren't competitive at all. So yeah, nothing can go wrong. <laughs> Before we sign off, can we just see your husband's face and can you tell us his name? Oh, yeah. What's his name? Oh, yeah. Jeff. Jeff Oberg. He, he was at the Naval Academy a year older than me. They want to see you, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Good over here, sunshine. We did meet at the 2-1. I met him when I was 19. There's Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> you got a good one. Oh, he went to Rachel's funeral and I didn't. So he is a good one. Thank you guys for all you're doing. Thanks. Thank you, ladies. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Vicki Rose Sampson, our beloved sound mixer and editor. Thanks also to producer Michael Doherty, who distributes and markets the show. Thanks to graphic designer Junglin Bay and sound designer Andy Bill. And thanks to Andrea Schreeman. Yep, that's me thanking myself in the third person, who books, produces, and directs the show. Please subscribe to the Hero Maker podcast wherever you listen and take a moment to rate us. It really helps the podcast grow. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at the Hero Maker Pod. If you'd like to collaborate or suggest a guest, please email us at media at theheromakerpodcast.com. The Hero Maker Podcast is a production of Prudent Pictures. Thank you so much for listening. Mine is the sunlight, mine is the morning, born of the one light, Eden saw play. Praise with elation, praise every morning, God's recreation of the new day.